Hey guys, and welcome back to Just Ask Jason. That's our weekly devotional here at Berean. Now I say here at Berean, but I'm not currently in the building. I'm actually at home. So welcome to my kitchen table. Anyway, this week we're going to be talking about empathy. What is empathy? Well, you probably felt a certain level of empathy when that ASPCA commercial comes on where like the lady's holding a dog on the couch and she's like, for one dollar a day, you can save a dog's life. And you have that song in the background that everyone hates now that's like, in the arms of the angels. I know I'm a beautiful singer. Anyway. That feeling that you have where you're like, man, this really sucks. I really want to do something. I really want to help these dogs out. I feel so bad for them. That is quite similar to empathy. Now, why I say it's quite similar is because most of us see that commercial and then we don't do anything. And I think true empathy requires us to act. So let me tie this in with a biblical narrative. In order to talk about empathy today, we're going to actually answer a question. And that question is, what makes Jesus cry? So if we're asking what makes Jesus cry, well, why that question? Why did we start there? Let me explain. In John eleven thirty five, we have one of the shortest verses in the entire Bible, depending on how you quantify short. Actually, if you're reading like the KJV or certain other like really literal translations in English, this is the shortest verse in the entire Bible. And the verse reads, Jesus wept. That's it. Jesus cried. So why did Jesus cry? Well, let me tell you the story. Jesus was off, you know, doing his Jesus stuff in some other town, and he had a friend living in a village near Jerusalem called Bethany, and this friend, his name was Lazarus. Actually, he didn't have just one friend in the town. Jesus had three very close friends, and they were all siblings. Lazarus was the only boy, and he had two sisters named Mary and Martha. And they were all very close to Jesus. They're all very good friends. Well, Lazarus got really, really sick while Jesus was out doing his Jesus things. And Mary and Martha went, you know what? It's okay. We have an idea. We're just going to send a message to Jesus. He'll come by. He'll, he'll heal Lazarus. You know, he'll stay for dinner maybe. And then he'll be on his way and everything will be okay. And Jesus had healed people who were paralyzed from the waist down. He made blind people see. And so they were pretty convinced that Jesus was either a good enough miracle worker or at the very least a good enough doctor that he was going to be able to fix this issue. And so they sent a message to Jesus. And Jesus replied, hey, guys. Don't worry about it. He's not going to die. This is actually meant to glorify God and to glorify God's son. And then Jesus hangs out in the same village that he was in for two more days. During those two days, Lazarus died. So they like wrap him up. They bury him and everything. Jesus still has a come. Well, eventually Jesus looks at his disciples and says, hey, our friend has fallen asleep. We're going to go wake him up. Which is a really weird thing to say when someone dies. Like, yeah, he's asleep. We're going to go wake him up. Gosh, he's always sleeping and always missing his alarms. It's a weird thing to say. But his disciples are like, all right, whatever, we're game. And they go with him. When they show up in the village of Bethany, Martha runs out to meet Jesus and immediately starts questioning him. And Jesus tells her, don't worry, your brother will be resurrected. And Martha is like, I know that like in the end times when God restores Israel and like all this is over, that the followers of God will be resurrected. That's when the Jews taught. And that's something that's still true for Christians, actually, that when God returns to earth to make everything right, that all the followers of God from Abraham to Billy Graham are going to be brought back. They're going to be resurrected and permitted to live uh, forever with God in a new restored earth. That's what the Bible teaches. And so she's like, I know that at some point, like thousands of years from now, whenever God comes back, that Lazarus will be resurrected and I'll get to see him then. But I miss him. I don't want to wait that long. 
Next, Jesus confronts Mary. And Mary's a little bit more direct. She just falls at his feet and was like, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. You could have fixed this. You could have saved him. I don't understand why you didn't come sooner. And the Bible says something pretty interesting here in verse uh, 33 or so. It says that Jesus was deeply troubled, that he was stirred in his spirit. Jesus asks Mary where they buried Lazarus. He goes to the tomb and he raises Lazarus from the dead. And that's pretty much the end of the story. But it leaves the question, why is it that in verse 35, Jesus is crying? Why does Jesus cry? Well, there's a couple different theories about this. Some people believe that Jesus was crying because he just, he was so sad that Lazarus died. He just missed Lazarus so much, but that doesn't make sense. Jesus had already said, look, Lazarus at the end of all this isn't going to be dead. He guaranteed that to the sisters. And when he looked at the disciples, he said, hey, guys, our brother Lazarus, our friend Lazarus, he's fallen asleep. Let's go wake him up, which is just a metaphor for Lazarus is dead. I'm going to go resurrect him. He knew Lazarus was going to be alive in just a few minutes. It doesn't make sense for him to be crying because, oh, no, Lazarus is dead and I'm never going to see him again. A second idea that's floated a lot is that Jesus was angry crying, that he was just so mad that Mary and Martha didn't believe that he was the son of God, that had all the powers of God, that he was so mad that this crowd didn't believe that he was the Messiah, that he like angry cried. Which again, just doesn't make sense. The word here for crying just means crying, to weep, normally out of sadness. And there's no indication anywhere in the story that Jesus is angry. He's sad. The attempt to say, hey, Jesus was angry crying, it's just an attempt to make Jesus sound more manly. The reality is, men cry too. And men don't just angry cry, and Jesus didn't just angry cry. Sometimes men, including Jesus, just cry because they're sad. Jesus was sad here. He wasn't angry crying. So why do I think that Jesus wept? I think, from the text, it's pretty obvious. When Mary looks at Jesus and says, hey, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. That's not just for getting really mad at him. Maybe she was a little mad at him. But I think there was a lot of pain in that. Can you imagine looking at someone, looking at the greatest doctor in the world and knowing that person could have saved your father or your mother? And they just decided to extend their vacation a couple more days. They figured out it'll be fine. And then when they finally show up, you'd probably be mad at them. You'd probably be like, why didn't you show up and save mom or save dad? But there'd be a big part of you that just hurt. It was just sad. It was like, we were so close to saving them. Why couldn't you show up a few days sooner? It's a lot of hopelessness, a lot of sadness. And I think Jesus felt that sadness. He felt empathy for Mary, for Martha, and for the crowd. When verse 33 says, when Jesus saw her weeping, the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was moved deeply in the spirit and was troubled. Jesus felt bad for all the people around him. He felt empathy when he saw all these people crying, when he saw how sad they were that Lazarus had passed. So what does he do? He goes to the tomb and he does what is within his power because he's Jesus. He brings Lazarus back to life. He sees all this sadness and he provides a solution. He provides comfort. When Jesus wept for others, he felt their pain and was moved by it. And more than that, he served them. He provided comfort for them. He didn't ride in on a white horse and demand tribute first. He just came. He talked to the people that were hurting and then he did what he could to help. So why are we talking about that today? Why are we talking about Jesus weeping? Why are we talking about Jesus's empathy? Because I want to ask you the question, why do you weep? 
Because we as Christians have a tendency of weeping, a tendency of crying, a tendency of being sad because of certain politicians, either ones that we really like leaving office or ones that we really don't like getting elected to office, certain laws getting passed because we feel like the morality of our country is just going down the drain and we get all upset over it or we weep over declining attendance at our churches. And at least that last one is something worth weeping about, in my opinion. But what should we first and foremost be sad over? What should we be weeping about? This text seems to indicate that if we want to be like Jesus, we should cry for broken and hurting people. We should cry for broken and hurting people. We should cry over homelessness, over broken marriages. And right now, as this pandemic kind of drags on, you know who should we, we should be crying for? Those that have lost family members. Those who have lost their jobs or been furloughed for so long, they can't afford rent anymore and they have no legal protections and they're getting kicked out of their apartments or duplexes or getting behind on their mortgages. We should be crying for those people, for the people that are going to find themselves homeless, for the people that when this is all over, it's not just that, okay, well, that was unfortunate and now I get my job back. The people who lost their jobs permanently and won't be able to find one for months or for years. Those are the people that we should be crying for. But a lot of us haven't even spared a second thought for them. So my encouragement to you today is to treat those people a little bit more like Jesus did. Empathize with them. Cry for them. And then do whatever is in your power to help them. For some of you, Maybe you're in a position because of where you're at in your company's structure to make some additional hires, to help some people out by providing them with an opportunity to work. And if that's you, maybe that's what you should do. For some of you, you are nowhere near being able to do that. In which case, all right, fine. God hasn't given you that opportunity, but how can you help? Does it look like interacting with your neighbors face to face or with your friends who are going through this and just giving them someone to vent to? Does it look like helping somebody write a resume or helping someone practice interviewing skills so they can get a job a little bit sooner? Does it look like helping a family member rebalance their budget to make things work while they're searching for employment? What does it look like for you? And who are you weeping for? Thank you guys for joining us here today on Just Ask Jason, our weekly devotional here at Brian. I hope you appreciated the new backdrops, all these different angles in my kitchen, and I hope you appreciated the devotional as well. If it was helpful to you, if it helped you to grow a little bit closer to God, to be a little more empathetic with people, or even if you just found it moderately interesting, please share this video on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Please subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, and while you're at it, go to our website, check out our website, check out our service times. If you're in the Murfreesboro, Carbondale area, we would love to have you. We are having two services. We are social distancing, so it's perfectly safe and we're sanitizing in between services as well. We'd love to see you soon. Anyways, I hope I'll see you back here next week, guys. Thank you for spending some time with me today. Bye.